Welcome to tonight's launch of Parapsychics, a new artist book on Kirsten Brash's work. Woo! <laughs> My name is Alethea Rockwell, and I am the Keith Herring Director of Education and Public Engagement here at the New Museum. And I'll just say to start, we're gathering tonight on the unceded land of the Lenape people, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to them and to the Lenape elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. So tonight's conversation will be moderated by Massimiliano Gioni, the new museum's Edlis Nissen Artistic Director. And it's a real pleasure to have artist Kirsten Brascht here to talk about the body of work represented in the book, um, along with Bettina Funke, the writer, editor, and art historian who dreamed up and edited the book along with Kirsten. And writer Lauren O'Neill Butler joins also um, and will offer further context on the project. So their conversation will last for about an hour, and then we'll open that up and have questions from all of you. And if you ever want to revisit this program, it'll be posted online on our YouTube channel in a couple of weeks. So you have a preview of the book on the screen now, Parapsychics. Uh, we're also passing around a new museum copy of the book, so you can get a sense for it as an object. You might have seen it outside, and it'll also be for sale in the store upstairs after the program. And before we get started, I'd just like to thank the New Museum team that makes these programs happen, Ginny Ha, Austin Bowes, and Derek Wright. Um, New Museum public programs are generously supported by the Charlotte and Bill Ford Artist Talks Fund. I'd like to acknowledge the Bowery Council of the New Museum for its support of education and public engagement programs. And thank you to our members and our supporters like you who come to these programs and make them possible. So with that, it's a real pleasure to pass things over to Massimiliano. Thank you, and uh, uh, thank you everybody for being here, and uh, Kerstin and Bettina and Lauren, and also many old friends in the audience. It's a nice reunion of sorts. I actually have to acknowledge Bettina for having set me up uh, uh, when I moved to New York. So <laughs> I'm thankful for the fact that she found me an apartment for free uh, for a few, it, it was meant to be a few months, it ended up being three years, but um, that was a, a very helpful beginning. Anyway, uh, we are here to discuss this wonderful book and to talk about Kerstin's work tonight. And I would start probably with the, the dumbest question of all, which is how did the book come about and how did this series of, uh, of drawings um, develop and, and was conceived? Hello. Well, uh, thank you for being here. Um, yeah, I was looking at my calendar because um, COVID kind of blurred the last three years into like one kind of colorful, sometimes gray cloud. So um, what I remember is that um, I actually just came to New York, back to New York from Europe um, in end of February, and I had like a really severe flu, like probably the worst flu I've ever had in my life. And... It was, I mean, besides being really scared, it was, um, I had these feverish dreams where I was like flying through dimensions and kind of like these almost out of body experiences. And um, so that kind of also blurred into then the beginning of COVID. Um, and in uh, mid-March, Bettina actually invited me to... Um, a woman's equinox retreat or workshop upstate at our friend's Kelly's place. And um, we actually learned or got introduced um, Qigong, which is um, like this internal process with outer movements. And it's hard to describe, similar to yoga, and I actually looked it up on Wikipedia, so I'm going to say <laughs> what Wikipedia says. Um, a mind-body-spirit practice that improves one's mental and physical health by integrating posture, movement, breathing technique. So um, I guess five days later or almost a week later, New York went into a hard lockdown. And uh, what I also started was another... Oh, and Kelly was actually then introducing Qigong as a Zoom community. So what I also was doing is was um, another Zoom community started by Ariana Rains, the poet, 
and it was um it's called invisible college so it was kind of like the school um a free school online where um i don't know up to 100 people were participating and we were collectively reading the story of inanna which is like the sumerian goddess um one of the first texts actually from a goddess and um what was amazing so she was the goddess of love fertility beauty and this text is about her like diving into the underworld and coming back out and there's like this moment which really struck with me where she was like fighting in a drinking game with her father enki the god of wisdom and she was taking all the maize from him so the maize are basically um like they represent all the positive and negative aspects of civilization so um I was really mesmerized with that. And then just on a very literal reality sense, I was in my rental apartment in the East Village, which is tiny. You basically open the door and fall over the kitchen into the bed. And um, the outside world felt like really, I mean, as we all remember, um, felt really precarious and uncanny and like unknown. And I guess with having just had this like insane flu and then just being stuck in my Zoom community because I live alone and my friends were just like in communication on the phone or my family uh, abroad in Germany. So I guess um, I started these drawings and they were like almost like this hmm, like time collector or like a clock which I could rely on besides the Zooms I did. And I also, I have to admit, I watched a lot of television I actually went through the entire uh, series of Sopranos. And um, yeah, so, um, <laughs> and I guess these drawings, um, I mean, it's hard to describe because it's almost like how to express the ineffable, right? Like, what is it, what keeps us alive in a moment when everything else is just so precarious or like porous? And um I guess what I did is, without knowing, I really used my body as a portal. And I would say, I mean, I'm interested in, as a painter, I always say I'm interested in painting in relationship to the body, whether it's physical, psychic, um, psychological, or um, social. And with the drawings, it's almost like diving into the mental body. And yeah, I mean, that's just... Um, Kind of just literal what what happened. How many drawings are in <clears throat> the final book? The final book has um, hundred drawings because originally I actually had this idea of like basing them on this divination aspect. Like I wanted to create my own tarot set. So a tarot set is seventy eight cards, means twenty two major arcana and um, fifty six minor arcana equals seventy eight. But when I reached seventy eight. I was like, hmm, maybe I make my own major arcana. So I added 22, which then equals 100. And um, with Tarot, I was, I mean, I like this idea of like kind of creating this, uh, whatever that means, this personal divination cards. But um, with Tarot, it's um, really somewhat linear because it has this idea of like the major arcana where you, um, follow the hero's um, path to enlightenment. Like it starts with a, it's like a hero, like a basic almost Hollywood story. Like it starts with a fool and then the fool, it ends up with a pope um, in the top and it starts with a fool at the bottom. And this like linear progression, I really had high doubts against because I was interested in something which really was based on a constant transformation or like a transitioning time, something where it was like more s relying on synchronicity of um, different existences at the same time. And just like on a material level, yes, I was like scratching it and like erasing things and like working back in and um, really excessively working on like several drawings at the same time and then sometimes placing them aside and going back in. So... I would say with Tarot, I just had like this doubt about this um, hierarchical approach. Um, More or less with the period of time that you require to make all the drawings, if it's relevant or... Two years. Two years, okay. Yeah. And were they meant to be a book from the beginning or the book came e naturally? 
Yes, uh, yes and no. Um, so first of all, they also really changed over the periods of time because um, I, um, well, okay, to answer your question, I always envisioned them being encased in a book, even though I didn't know how this book is going to look like. And in the end, you know, of course, I needed Patina's help to like really put my thoughts together. But I always envisioned them to be together in one container so because I knew at some point once they are exhibited, they might just be spread out in the world and then they will never have this like moment of like being enclosed together again. So the vision of a book was there and also I knew I had to make titles for them which are equally important than the actual drawings because I, and that took a long time actually to figure out how I'm going to title them and in which different directions the titles were like referring to um, content-wise or reference-wise, like books or essays I've been re reading, old titles I've been revisiting. I went into the German book of superstition um, to like pull some ideas from there. And um, so I knew that, that this needs a space somehow. And then, um, okay, three months I was in my apartment and again like it the the outer world was like somewhat as we remember it was like really ungraspable what was happening and the i had very rare social contact i remember every time at 7 p.m you opened your window and you were clapping for the helpers in the hospital so that was like one big moment of like socializing with your neighbors across the street and uh so, and I also remember I had like really like this big fear of physical touch because suddenly, and in New York, you know, it's full of people. So, and there was like this weird common sense of like, don't come too close because you can be, you know, a threat. Um, and then while I was drawing, obviously I was running out of materials because everything was like, all the stores were closed, especially colored pencils were on back order because all kids were homeschooled. And I mean, I have to say, I had really, I was lucky because um, other people had to, you know, homeschool their children. So I remember this moment where actually my friend and collaborator, Debo, met me at the crossroads in Delancey Street and handed me his last stumps of black pencils. And I just felt like, oh my God, what a friend. <laughs> Gives me his and his children one. were kicked out of school. <laughs> <laughs> because they had no black anymore, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it felt really uh, like meaningful and existential. So, um, yeah, and I guess with the drawings, I was just almost like peering up with myself and like diving more and more inward without any like outer intention. It just naturally happened. And then, oh, well, then my whole location changed because actually Bettina um, offered me their place to house it. And that had a huge difference um, also on the drawings because then they almost transitioned between like seeing and being and I was observing my surroundings suddenly I could see the sky um, I had an outer area um, and Bettina is wearing the shirt right now um, so if you flip through the book there's like actually many drawings which are somewhat based on that shirt which was hanging on the wall at their place in the living room and I mean, I assume it was really <laughs> influential. And it's, from paper, it's from Paper Red, 2003. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, these like creatures emerged into the um, drawings also. And then there was a moment, um, I guess it was like in August, in the midst of summer, where our friend Kelly, the Qigong teacher, offered me their place to house it in the countryside. And in that moment... I was suddenly in this like huge garden I had to take care of. So um, maybe you want to show the um, garden image. Yeah. So I just wanted to say, because while I was working on the drawings, I was actually um, working on a large scale garden project in France, which then due to COVID got canceled. But I just thought I might want to just show a couple images because it somewhat goes into what the drawings were also about. So the idea of this garden was it was based on the painting, which we just saw, the uh, oil on Myla painting, and that that painting was trans, um, translated into uh, plants on the ground. 
into a giant garden. Then this is the second design. There were many designs. And the first was like, it was like this future garden idea of like many gardens in one, like a Hildegard von Bing herbal section and the Japanese children's maze and like a wildflower meadow. And then um, pergola with mosaics on the floor, which I consider like paintings, traversable paintings facing the sky. So I was interested in that moment how to collaborate with the universe and like how to integrate like plant life and living matter, which you can't control, which are like outlasting yourself into, in this case, for example, stained glass, metal constructions, which were supposed to be um, merged with ranking flowers. And, and here you see the model um, or the first model and part of the uh, garden, Hello? Ah. Part of the garden was also these um, Yanta Mantas. So here you see the model of that. It's um, astronomical devices um, which measure time. And so you can, uh, just by the naked eye, you can actually observe how the shadow hits the steps. And then you can, I don't know, see what time it is or when the next uh, planetary movement happens. And I really like this idea of like turning one of the drawings, the parapsychic drawings, into uh, like a fresco sundial. So like the idea of like painting, measuring time, and then kind of being outlast by my own existence. That was somewhat what I was really working on in that moment. And I guess this in the back of my mind was somewhat influencing how I was drawing. Yes. And maybe I'll ask Bettina how the, the book itself developed and, uh, you know, the choice of the contributors. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, as you see it, it's a, a quite rich in, in references and, um, and annotations, in a sense, as one section is called. Yes, yes. I think just listening to Kerstin, you get a sense what a vast moving world um, we're dealing with. And um, at the same time, it's also very humble. It's this moment that we were all in, stuck at home. And Kerstin is usually a very restless, always moving, always traveling, always collaborating. And suddenly she finds herself stuck at home, first in like a, you know, almost like a chamber-sized apartment. And this monastic life is suggested to her, put upon her. And in some ways, many of us probably also can relate to several aspects of, of all of this. And um, so she called me in um, August 2021 and she said, I've been doing these drawings and there's going to be a hundred. I'm still working on them and they're so important to me. And, and she just was this waterfall of, you know, of ideas and, um, and I said, I want to make a book and it also has to be a mystic almanac. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> I'd love to see these drawings. Um, and so uh, that's where it started. And because the drawings were so amazing and because Kerstin and I, and I have known each other for 15 years and done things together in, in different ways and it felt like, I, yes, this is, I, I need to commit. This is a very complex, difficult, but fascinating conversation. And it went into many, I mean, clearly they needed to be in a book and they needed to be produced, you know, very beautifully to really be taken care of in one, to keep them in one place. But we went from all over the place. We went from, they, they need nothing. They just need to be reproduced as drawings to there needs to be a mystic almanac. <laughs> also, um, the circumstances of what, you know, creates a book were entirely uncertain. There was just a lot of desire and commitment, but how to produce it, how to pay for it, where it would, what it would belong to as, you know, beyond an artist book. It was all evolving while we were working on it. And, you know, books needs, they need a home, just like we need the new museum to say, and thank you so much, Massimiliano, let's share this book with everyone and launch it. Um, to make a book, you also need homes and people who support it. And um, so then Kerstin and I went back and forth and it was really um, a very productive, difficult struggle of two strong minds. Um, <laughs> I often found myself in this um, 
sort of unfortunate position of you know like saying no or stopping her which you know when I work with artists I want to help realize their dreams I don't want to suffocate their dreams so it was really um, challenging and um, in the end um, we said to make this possible to become a book why don't we we had looked at about 50 different kinds of material from a Gnostic tradition, you know, like going circling the globe and covering various centuries. And um, some pieces had a very specific personal relationship to casting and the, the process of drawing and the time we were living in and other material had been important to me. And so we kind of zoned in and said, yes, let's make a, a group, group of excerpts that all have quite different sources and um, we produce them along with these drawings. Um, and I guess it's also worth mentioning, you know, the very basic question, you have this visual world that evolves and it, it you know, it's like a non-linear world and cosmolo cosmology that Castian invites us into with these drawings. And then you have language and language is so much more concrete. It's abstract, but it's more specific. And so, this idea of words freezing images into a meaning that they, you know, and so, so how to pair texts um, with drawings was another question we kind of struggled with. Um, so there's, um, you're seeing a few, a few of the different um, excerpts we included. I'm going to quickly tell you about them. Of course, Inanna, that was so important to her, the hymn to her of the first recorded uh, goddess. Um, needed to be excerpted at length. Um, and then Kerstin read, read Lucrez in her AP Latin course in high school, and um, this was really still on her mind, and it seemed so fitting to have a philosophical poem about nature of uh, mind and soul in relation to death, death as also transformation. Um, Michael Tausig, the anthropologist who... Um, wrote a non-fiction tale about the color lapis lazuli's role in art's aim to represent the sacred. And the book itself is lapis lazuli blue, not only on the cover, but also on its sides. So that's very casting, you know, nothing is ever enough. Like you, you will, <laughs> we need one more and one more. And I'm usually less is more, less is more. So we were an amazing combination of troubles. Um, and then I, I was really touched by Donna Haraway's film, Storytelling as Earthly Survival, and um, I transcribed... Stay with the trouble. <laughs> Stay with the trouble, yeah, that's her phrase. And so I had transcribed part of her monologue, um, calling for new trans-species stories that's reproduced. Um, and then we're coming, coming now into the contemporary time, Merlin Sheldrake's epilogue to his book about the entangled life of mushrooms we reproduced. And then um, the trans intellectual, as he calls himself, Bayo Akomelafe from Nigeria, who is combining his Western philosophical training and teaching with his newly found uh, Yoruba tradition that he realizes he had suppressed all his life. And so in a way he's doing what the whole world is doing, we're slowly taking apart our Western ideas of how life is made, how we organize socially and this um, sort of like undermining it or trans telling it with inserts of a more cosmological Yoruba kind of storytelling and I was really impressed by him um, when I was I, I kind of started studying him in the pandemic and there were two um, talks I liked in this uh, in particular one was about um, slowing down, um, that we all need to slow down as our sanctuary, which we were doing anyway, but he was reflecting on it, what that meant. And he had written an amazing, I thought the best text on COVID, which is called Mother Monster Trickster. Um, so it's also um, a reproduction about how the trickster comes, this mischievous logic interrupts um, life as we know it. Um, and the other suggestion is to go into the cracks where he says, you know, this is where it's dark and feminine and and collective. Um, so um, it was important that these came from different sources as well as different cultures and centuries. Um, and a hinge between the drawings 
And the writing um, are Sia Conrad's poems. Maybe you want to say something about those? Yeah, I actually got um, introduced to them um, through Ariana's uh, Invisible College class, where I guess CA was um, talking about their work. And then when I was teaching back in Germany, my last relocation, while I finished all the drawings in the end, um, I was actually teaching in uh, the Academy, Art Academy in Nuremberg, and I invited them to um, for a workshop on somatic uh, poetry, which was actually really incredible. And I mean, it went on and on. We then the, we did an exhibition based on the somatic poetry, which CA was teaching us, and was really great. So I invited them then if they wanted to provide us some. Um, poems for the book and they were really excited about it and we mm. did like an excerpt of 12 I guess yeah um, several so we were hoping that these these excerpted texts would invite readers to Maybe. go through a similar sense of like you know interwovenness and connectedness of everything with everything in the book like a, an excerpt would bring you to a drawing to a title of the drawing to and then also oh, you were so, yeah I just want to say like also the idea of CA sees um, their poems like, I mean, they are rituals or based on rituals and then they are written. So um, all the poems are also like somewhat creatures. So that's why they have all these individual shapes. And Bettina and I thought that's a really nice hinge between like the text excerpts or also the newly commissioned text and then my drawings. So that you know, which are so, many of them are somewhat creature-like or, um, yeah, here you can see. We just thought it's a nice... The book that is circulating in the audience, uh, I think has seen three people so far, so you will get to you eventually. <laughs> and that's just to say how precious and, and beautiful yeah. it is. He has a, a sort of illuminated manuscript quality to it, no? In, uh, um, but I, I wanted to turn a second to, to Lauren to not to put you in a, um, on the spot, but uh, to somehow um, you know place this work in uh, in dialogue with other works by other artists that uh, might have interest you or that you see some uh, uh, you know Bettina was saying it's a key to paranoid and mystical thinking that everything is connected to something else and must mean something. So I'm uh, curious about. You know, what connections do you draw between uh, this body of work and, and the work of other artists? Well, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, there's, a, there's a lot. I mean, I, I feel like I could teach a whole class on this, maybe, and maybe I will someday, but I've thought of a lot of people. A lot of, a lot of names have come through the, the, my mind when I looked through the books. At first, it was Hildegard of Bingen and sort of moved through um, many, many many, 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 many names. And there is a wonderful show at the Drawing Center right now, curated by Olivia Shaw, who's with us tonight. And I recommend everyone go see that because I, I wrote an essay for the catalog for it. There's wonderful, a lot of the people I've thought about were based on Olivia's research. And um, so, yes. Um, and the title of the show is? The title of the show is Of Mythic Worlds. Yes. Maybe we could pull up the Witten slide. So the person who came to mind the most is Jack, the great Jack Witten. Um, and when I was researching Olivia's, uh, the essay for Olivia over the summer, I reread Notes from the Woodshed, which is um, his notebook, his studio notebook. And it was edited by the wonderful Katie Siegel. Um, and I reread it because Olivia had said to me, you know, Witten is interesting to put in here, right? Like he did not speak about spiritualism and did not want to be called a mystic. And, you know, it's the family has said, you know, don't don't push that too hard. And yet I remembered a passage uh, from the late 1970s where he said this sort of amazing thing. And I thought to share it with you because I see connections of much of what Kirsten has talked about, for example, when she says, I used my body as a portal um, I think about this Witten, this Witten passage. So he wrote in March 17th, 1978, very few people know the energy that passes through my body. Most people sense it but are afraid to acknowledge it. Women are either enthralled by it or run away from it. I try to live with it. 
I am beginning to understand that I am in touch with something. I have no other way to express this except, quote unquote, in touch. In touch with what I do not know, and I try not to think about it. Maybe it is what the older people back home call God. Maybe it is what ancient people meant by the spirit. In American Indian terms, the great spirit. And then in capitals, I do not know what it is or what to call it. I have no logic to explain what I feel or see. What's different about my work, it is in touch with what I feel and therefore expresses a certain sensibility which we are not familiar with. I am possessed with visions, which he then struck through, the spirit with this like interesting little arrow thing. I use this word for I have nothing else. It guides me and takes over when my logic reaches its, reaches its turning point. And it, and it goes on and it's really beautiful. Um, and if you don't have that book, please go buy it now because it's just the best. I, I ask all my students to read it. And so I think there's this sort of um, tiptoeing around the mystical tradition here. Like, I don't think we have our feet totally in there. I don't think we're doing real mystical work. At least I don't, it doesn't seem this way. Like we allude to it, we go around it. And it's something I've seen many, no, not so many, but, but artists have sort of done this for a while now. And I think this is an interesting part of Witten, for example, of it is, but it's not, right? And this is a really telling passage from the studio notebook. Um, if you want to go to the next Witten slide, you can sort of see what he was making at that time. Which, uh, so this is up at Dia Beacon now. This was, you know, around 1978, he made Key. I'm sure we're probably all fami familiar with his process, but he would, um, you know, lay the canvas over the studio floor and there were things under it. And he would prepare the surface with gesso and then he would layer with thin sheets of, of colored Japanese rice paper. The rice paper dissolved, leaving behind pure pigment. And then he would pull his developer over the canvases. So if you haven't seen the show at Dia Beacon, also please go see that because it's astounding. Um, and so he would, he would develop the works. He talked a lot about photography also in the, in the notes from the Woodshed book. Um, and, I, and Witten also comes to mind because, you know, there's also Kirsten's background in thinking about traditional arts or what, I don't know what we would call them exactly, but, and then also ranging all the way through to the digital and to the sort of, I don't know, to the screen. I don't know how else to say it. And then there's this, uh, I like the last, I, I, I pulled this from the Art Institute because I think this like, the idea of the ghost-like images is really important and the, the canvases really do vibrate. Okay, so there's, there's one example of somebody who came to mind that I, that I think is relevant in terms of that, like, it's mystical, but it's not quite. This isn't, this isn't full on mysticism. It's really like, you know, um, not totally. At least that I, I don't know. I don't know what you, <laughs> it could be. And then can we have the, and then so yeah, Merritt Oppenheim. So this, this was kind of tucked away at the recent MoMA show. I don't know if anyone saw it. Um, it was sort of near the end. It was, um, yeah. And it struck me because this is, you know, Oppenheim, as the wall label said, believed that she did not originate the ideas present in her art, but that she channeled them, selecting them from a long line of universal concept that could be traced back to ancient times. And so that's a really interesting, I think this is a wonderful drawing of her, um, her CV since the year 60,000 BC and her self-portrait. Um, so, so these are some works that I thought about. I, you know, there are so many more. Uh, I've had countless talks with artists where this sort of comes up, where they speak about themselves as a channel or a medium, that something's happening. The great spirit, they don't know what to call it. They don't really want to get into it. They don't want me to publish that part. Like, please put that off the record. <laughs> and sometimes it's off the record and sometimes it's not. But um, yeah, I think that there's, this was interesting to me. There's a general feeling now of like maybe we can talk about this a little bit more um, in the art history field. I think we're finally warming up to talking about mysticism slightly. And so we'll see where that goes. It used to be very taboo to talk about it. So, but artists always have. Um, well, uh, in a sense, now we maybe come to the crux of <laughs> a lot of your work, which, uh, you know, significantly, I think you called the book and the series parapsychic, not to indicate there is a proximity, but also a distance, and, um, and also to play a, a maybe a very German game of uh, 
proximity and distance, which you know artists like Albert Erlen or the whole Cologne school have um, made um, entire careers on. Now, this idea that you combine uh, sincerity with irony in in very stratified ways, and uh, and I think is also what makes your work somewhat more contemporary than uh, um, just a an embrace of ideas around mysticism. You know, so I. I I would laugh a little bit when you talk about whatever it's called, the alignment of body and spirit that you were watching on Zoom. You know, there is a, um, I have great respect for alternative knowledge, but I also can't avoid laughing. You know, the, when I was uh, thinking of, of this meeting today. Uh, laugh a lot while doing Qigong, actually. No, but you know, the, there is the, I'm, I'm split myself. You know, I included Ilma Clint in the Venice Biennale and I, I'm a sucker, you know, the Venice Biennale started with Jung, uh, Red Book, I'm a sucker for that type of mythology. But then I also cannot not remember Adorno's thesis against occultism and, and you know, this whole idea of mysticism basically being evidence of a society on the verge of uh, madness and stupidity. <laughs> and, and, you know, also the idea that mysteriously all our um, engagement with the spiritual world always bring back just the greetings from a dead grandmother, not the, the fact that you go to the psychic not to discover uh, uh, atomic uh, <laughs> fixation, but you go to speak to a lover who, who disappears. So I'm curious, first of all, how this idea of the psychic develop, which is also a very quintessential New York story in a sense, because it's connected to the psychic right. in the East Village or Chinatown. And also, I, I, it's probably impossible for you to articulate whether or not you believe in these energies, but I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more um, how they exist in your work. Yeah, I, I want to ask Derek um, if you could pull up the PDF again. And um, so now we basically skipped the installation part. Could yeah, we'll you go back to it. Yes. Uh, I veered off script for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> the German um, contingent. <laughs> so like after this, after the white page. <laughs> um, so yes, exactly. So many of you guys know when I came first to New York in 2005, um, I was still studying with Lothar Baumgarten in Berlin and I came here on a grant and studied at, in the MFA program in Columbia. And it was the first time in America and the first thing which really struck my mind was these giant neon signs, palm readings, $5 telling my future and I was like wow that's amazing I can just pay five dollars and somebody sorts out my future that's incredible so I went and I have to say as often in my life I was very confused and I thought <laughs> they could somehow sort me and align me again and uh, so I went probably to I don't know 50 100 and they all said the same thing. You have a black aura. Yeah, 100, right? <laughs> they all said the same thing. You have a black aura. You need a healing. I'm like, oh, my God. So um, For $100. They <laughs> after. So I spent, yeah, I spent all my, my savings, how to say, my, the money I had. I went to the psychic. And, but it was, I mean, sure, there was a curiosity of, like, what they would tell me about my future. But... I was, I think I almost got like addicted to this fact of like this oscillation between believing and disbelieving. So it was never just the one side. It was always simultaneously, always exactly the opposite. So it was like, I was laughing about it, but at the same time, stopping laughing, being like, oh no, it's somewhat true what I'm saying. <laughs> so um, this oscillation or this like almost like split figure, I tried to then bring into the studio while I was studying. So what I did is I painted these like small psychics, I call them. And um, you can just slowly flip through the images maybe. And um, oh, also I was making this like psychic atlas where I reread it recently. I'm like, hmm, I'm actually, it's still the same thing 20 years later. <laughs> so <laughs> hmm, what does that say? But um yeah, so I basically said, like, build a provisionary truth, you know, the confusion is the picture. And um, so anyways, I painted these paintings and they were almost like placeholders, like these voids or um, like abstract powerheads, energy forms. And 
what was important to me was that they were like these provisional truths or like temporary and that they really staged them. They were like too big for my body size. They were actually too big for the studio because the studio in Colombia was so tiny that they curled up to the ceiling and on the ground. And, um, and they were on paper. So because I went to America with this question of like, what does it mean to be a painter, a German painter, a German female painter with all that baggage, the German mostly male figures. And um, so I almost invited everything which I would have been usually embarrassed about, you know, whether it's certain color palettes or like uh, pastel or I don't know, certain references to like Steiner and boys and so on. So I kind of went in there, but it was always like with this almost tongue in cheek or like staging aspect. So yeah, and then here you see like how I actually showed them and these like metal, um, transparent metal um, constructions and which I actually reused now at the parapsychic show of the drawings. Um, and just we are patting ourselves on the back. The first museum show, it was at the new museum in 2009 where mm. the psychic were, um, were shown. And yeah. uh, um, you mentioned so, in a sense the lineage of German, no, you want to uh, Yeah, I actually, um, what, what I was just uh, thinking was like, I was actually questioning myself as a painter, but then interestingly enough through the medium of the psychic. So um, it was kind of like mirroring myself asking uh, who's Kirsten Bretsch and if so how many and then so like the answer would always be like yeah it's like through me but then or via myself but then also through the psychic yeah a uh, 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 couple of questions first of all you know the medium obviously is the um, the person in the sense but today the medium is technology and and there has been a lot of conversation also as Lauren was pointing at you know the combination of uh, these ideas around energy were born uh, um, parallelly to, you know, X-rays and uh, uh, radio and research around invisible energies, and and they have a sort of resurgence today when you know we have a wireless existence. So the, there is a sort of maybe mystical processing of technologies changing, and and your work and many of the work of artists that are somewhat seen in dialogue in your generation and not to put also people in the room, but like Seth Price or Wade Guyton and have been seen also as, uh, you know, trying to negotiate painting in the age of hyper communication and technology. So uh, I want to ask you and actually all of you, if you have any thought about how you see your own work, whether you, you see it engaging with technology in any way and whether it can tell us something. Um, you know, again, the irony of doing something about recentering your body, but on Zoom is, in a sense, the tragic comic condition in which we all live. You know, this dream of <laughs> repossessing our body, but on Zoom is uh, uh, maybe a little bit the, the, the tragedy we... Um, maybe we just continue with the slide, so it just shows some other body of works. And um, to, so I'm going to circle around a little bit of your question. Um, because this is chronological, so like another body of work were the, these coin paintings where I actually poured pigments on the ground, literally, like Sigmar Polka did. But then I uh, kind of, again, with the question of like, what does it mean to paint? And then I had like, there was like this crave of like signature, like a signature of the painter. And I think I was somewhat uncomfortable with this, with like suddenly being on stage, but then also staging it at the same time. And um, so, um, how to say, um, I, I literally put change on the like chart constellations on the paintings and like gave to give them a price tag with pennies. And um, so, but what happened then was actually that they were falling down because the paper can't hold that much change. So with this like weird commentary of like, oh yeah, being like this, <laughs> uh, how to say, uh, this, like in a bad sense, sellout painter, it turned the painting into a wishing well because the coins were like falling in front of the painting and stayed there and people who s visit him the shows, they actually added the coins in front of the the work and I was like this is kind of incredible that this happens <laughs> so this like offering 
Um, and there again, we have like this split, right? Between like um, what I just said before, like believing, disbelieving, or, and then actually the next body of work were these block radians where, I mean, uh, it was a literal simple idea, which I got, um, I think it was like Canal Street where you have like these name painters and they just dip their colors in a uh, sponge and then write your names with some leaves on it. And, and I thought, oh, this is a great idea. It's like so simple. And it really refers to like this idea of like Photoshop or like this digital tool where like everything is already in there in this toolbox. So you have like this one brush stroke and it's already the ray of light. And so it's like this ready-made, you know, painter's hand. And this actually, which I think my mic is weird. But um, so, yeah, so, and then with this like ready-made brush stroke, referring somewhat maybe to what you were, were mentioning about the digital, because I looked at the brush stroke as if it's like a tool from Photoshop, but at the same time, the brush stroke was, as you see here, was looking like wings or something which had a life. Like I was interested in this moment of like depicting something which is not visible, like radiation or heat, sweat, um, dried leaves, um, you name it, fish bones. And so the brush stroke itself, which is actually the painter's hand or the painter's signature, was pretending it had a body or pretending it was folded or... Um, yeah, so I guess maybe in somewhat of an abstracted sense, I was dealing with what you would claim the digital. Because yeah. it was like, for me, it was more like literal, like this immediacy in it. Lauren, again, not to make you play the role of the art historian, but obviously a lot of um, uh, myths around the invisible and the mystical are also profoundly gendered. No, obviously the you know from the hysteric to the medium, um, it's often a woman that that is the channel for for energies. I don't know if you have any thought about that when it comes to to the work of artists like you know that they become somewhat very popular in the last few years, like Ilma Clint or Emma Kunz or uh, um, what's her name, Julian Wintish, and so forth. Yeah, and I think just to your point earlier, the the reason why art history and philosophy shunned mysticism so long was the idea that a woman in particular would have a direct connection to the, the divine with no mediation between, like a priest or whatever, is not okay. <laughs> so, no, so no, you know, like, no, 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 we cannot have this. So all of these women who profess to have a direct connection to the divine were not their stories were not told. They were burned at the stake, and their stories were not told. And then in the 1970s, the books were you know finally published. Um, there's so many I could talk about. So yeah, I mean, beginning there. So the stories were not told. So it was not surprising that Helma Offklimp was not seen for so long because no one wanted to think that she would have a direct, you know, some sort of direct connection to the. And when I say the divine, I just mean like the void, the ab the, the, the unknown, the abstract. You know, the one. There are many. There are many ways to talk about. It. I don't mean God. So yeah, I mean, it's it's the two part of it was great misogyny of uh, women having this, having these experiences, and speaking about them directly, r often writing. Uh, Julian of Norwich is known as the first uh, writer in England, um, the earliest writer of England. And long story short, she's a mystic. So her book was the first sort of like written by a woman. Like what is it now? Anyway, we have to look it up. So, um, yeah, like the, the, there was a, I think there was a, a, a great reason and these things went hand in hand. And so then of course for artists, it's the same, same deal. Like how could they have this direct connection to the divine? There's no way we, we cannot have this. Let's not let them talk and let's not show the art until now, you know, in a way, the tension between the material and the immaterial has always been at the center of art because whatever art expresses materially in a space and time goes beyond what we can grasp or articulate. It, it's an experience in that sense. So in that sense, it's really old. And maybe now this odd combination of living more and more in an immaterial world through our various tools and phones and computer and so on that also suggests 
the potential connection with everything with a click of a button we're like oddly in touch not consciously but we're kind of wandering into the world of the immaterial much more and um you know the logical conclusion would be that the centrality of the human in the world will be questioned and i feel like in a philosophical sense we're like switching into a world where there's more room now to consider cosmological views of the world um and you know this flickering this flickering between is it this or is it that has has become sort of you know ready for the salon like we can we can talk about it now um maybe this is actually not a bad moment to to look at one more part of the book where we looked at images that were inspirational for you that sounds really too big that word images that inspired you during that time and uh, Kerstin and I had tried to do an interview for the book and it just wasn't the right form it was kind of too clunky and so instead we wrote annotations to images that accompanied her in that time um sort of explaining their personal connection to you as well as some historical context. Um, this is the end of the book. And if you go, just yeah, show the front, few. the other half. Yeah. Um, since uh, we're talking about the invisible, maybe you can demonstrate. Yes. Oh, and um, as we load the images, in the right, yeah, uh, what and images? Maybe just leave it there for a moment. Um, speaking, yeah, this is the perfect moment for the <laughs> demonstration. <laughs> this is the... Um, On page two, there's uh, I need some more water. Can you stand up, maybe? Oh, there's like that's the expressionist the, painter. Uh, work. The Hortus Conclusus, like the un, from an unknown master from the Upper Rhine, is like actually wrapping around the book. In the end, is well, the very end is here. <laughs> There we go, and then it wraps around, and then in the front, and it's just little, and it even peeks out yeah. on the spine. So if you wet the page, it reveals it's a hidden just page. It's called yeah. wet and view effect. It's very literal, and um, <laughs> so also good illustration for nothing is ever enough for cast. <laughs> <laughs> and then it hides again. So yeah, well, I just like the idea of like you know putting the content around, like wrapped around the garden. The garden wrapping around the content and and the veiling and unveiling the visible and invisible as this constant movement. Um, and so these images, Bettina, you were saying how were so they? So these, shown? this is um, what we called um, annotations, inspirations. Um, and if you go two more slides forward, um, th so Kerstin and I co-wrote these annotations and. No, so these are the images. Um, Kerstin, you want to say something about this one? I mean, I yeah, mean, that's a depiction of Inanna. And uh, I mean, I don't know exactly any oh, well, it's, it's, you know, it's, um, it, We've said enough about Inanna. Maybe we'll go yeah. to the next image. Um, <clears throat> it's the a depiction of the Wheel of Fortune, where this particular one is somewhat interesting because there's no... Again, like I think what, what wraps around the book as a theme is like this idea of time or like different experiences of time. And here also like um, present, past and future are existing at the same time. There's no linear um, understanding of it yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm about to rule. I rule. I have ruled. I'm without kingdom. So it's a circular. Um, Wheel of fortune. <laughs> Wheel of fortune, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then this is like the image we just looked at. Um, the unknown master of the Upper Rhine, like a rich garden scene in the Hortus Conclusus. And then the blue is Lapus Lazuli, so that led into the decision of like making the book blue. Uh, you haven't mentioned him, but I know it's a big reference for you, um, which may be cast in ironic. Uh, shadow on the whole proceeding. You know, uh, Alighiero Boetti wanted his, da his ashes to be thrown in this lake in Afghanistan where lapis lazulis um, were extracted to make color. But uh, you often mentioned this poster by Alighiero Boetti that 
uh, depicts the artist as a showman and a shaman. No, that there has this kind of uh, mm. dualistic tension between again sincerity, mysticism, mm. but also the act of uh, being a, um, a performer and, mm. and, a, and a showman. So I don't mm. know if, uh, um, has his work ever been of reference to you or specifically just that? I mean, not specifically, but I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I would say almost all my work has this somewhat, it's, it's, it's this question of like shaman, showman is embodied in many different strengths of my work. And it's not that I'm sitting there literally and asking myself this question, but it just happens to be <laughs> like coming out like this. Even like this extending of one's own hand to the artisan, whether it's like glass, marbling, stokomamo, and then like turning into this like forearm monster, two hands of a glass man, two hands, a marbler, two hands of a artist, and then turning into this like third entity, so to say. Um, but then it's also somewhat funny. You know, actually, uh, Derek, if you can show my slide, so to speak, it's another example of this uh, crisis of, uh, you know, believing and uh, and agnosticism that it's going to come. I don't want to ruin it. Yeah. Uh, dun, 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 dun. It's you know the famous Sigmar Polke painting that higher beings command to paint the top corner black. And it's uh, again this, you know, belief in this higher and in fact himself you know would go on to to play this role of the alchemist and whether he believed it or not but um there is also again a, a sort of slapstick comedy of um, of mysticism in this painting uh, do you want to talk a little bit about actually how the drawings then became an exhibition and um i mean yeah it's just basically a couple of slides where um i had three iterations one was the first one was at gladstone gallery uptown and uh, the second one is at Joe Marconi's and the third one in the Ludwig Forum Aachen. And the I also want them to not just be framed in like um, traditional frames, but like encase them in these like plexiglass boxes. So they almost were like encased like a fly in amber. Like you have like this frozen moment in time where... And also... It was important since, again, back with this idea of like this divisional um, or like this tarot card idea um, that I always saw them in relation to each other. So they were pairs, they were groupings, sometimes it was a single card, so to say. And so it was maybe similar to a film strip or something that um, they you could see them yeah, in, in relation. So they were almost like ten tentacles um, reaching out to their sisters. And then I decided to um, 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 ask my um, colleague Wiebke Tiax, uh, who is a sound artist, to um, give sound to the titles so that then the titles actually existed um, in, um, yeah, as a projection. And then in Aachen, um, I added, you will see probably in a minute, in Aachen I added um, like another collaborative work by Aira Kava and myself, which was this foot bath. And I put uh, former um, glass works of mine, like these Oculini glasses in the foot bath. So you could sit there as if in a waiting room, like for departure and arrival and like get surrounded by these soundscape um, to the titles. Uh, here you see like a projection of the titles. And the titles also, they are half-half um, German and half-half English. And I also didn't want to translate them because they felt like more immediate if some parts we didn't translate. And there was also like a decision Bettina and I made for the book that we didn't want to, we didn't want certain things to be translated within the titles. Here you see this footpath. Um, and then, um, yeah, and I added plants just like as this references because um, I really, I mean, plant life had such a big role in the time of the production of the drawings that I wanted to bring them into the exhibition space. And then in Aachen, um, as I formerly um, mentioned already, I brought back these like freestanding metal con um, structures where originally I showed the psychics on and then in Aachen I placed the drawings on there and I 
really wanted them to be um, in between the viewer, not so that the viewer is in front of the work, but really like immersed within the work. Um, yeah, I guess. It's coming up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, um, so maybe I have one last question and then we can also hear it from you or from the audience. But um, in a sense, these drawings are very much, you know, um, hands-on effort and, you know, somewhat modest in scale. And let's say in, in the first person, whether or not it's <laughs> which curse thing, we don't know. Um, but a lot of your work has also explored collaboration or, you know, you have formed a few collectives, which I myself have no idea if they're real or not. I mean, if, uh, you know, from Das Institute, uh, the, the, this idea of a kind of exploded personality or identity as a incorporation, no? identity as a company has always been uh, part of, uh, of your work and that has often led to collaboration. So maybe I wanted to ask you about the difference of working on your own and instead collaborating and we can see some images of how the marblings are made and the gestures and and what is you know what shifts in your work when uh, if and when you work alone i mean i would be tempted to say that even when you work alone you're working with others but with myself, right? <laughs> <laughs> i mean i guess with the drawings i literally was collaborating with myself i had no other choice but i mean each of my collaborations is different and i mean for example, like Debo and I, as Kaya, it's uh, much more harsh and almost brutal, you know, like this German painter and an American sculptor m merging and creating this so-called like third body. And it's like literally hands on like DIY, um, almost like how to say, like stitching the painting and cutting it up and then like bringing it back to life. So um, it has like also... Um, big performative aspect and um, but I would say each of my collaboration is really um, based on trust and um, which is obviously built over time again and so I like this extension of my hand towards the craftsman for example um, I really had to find and research the right person who then this strange moment would actually it happened with all of the craftsmen where I didn't know anymore who I was. I was like, what am I now this like marbling person? And I remember the marbler the first time when he came to New York, um, he was like, I'm not going back home. You know, I'm, uh, I'm just like with these like small baths I have at home. I have to make wallpapers now and I'm staying in New York. And so and it was actually kind of incredible, this moment where you turn into this like neophyte and this like not knowing person. And I think this is maybe what a collaboration, my, my interest in collaboration is because it's like entering this space of not knowing and then like obviously like learning through the other person and then maybe the other person also doesn't know. So you find something which is, um, you know, not, not able to being forecast. Busted. So in the spirit of collaboration, we can ask uh, if the audience has any question or if you have questions for each other. Are you pleased with the book? I would imagine so. Was it a tough process to then bring it down to <laughs> what it was? Or? Yeah, it was. It took a long time and there were many hurdles, but we uh, turned into this like Olympic team of... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm really happy with it, yes. I mean, there were also like moments, for example, the cover, um, the book was almost ready about to g get printed. And then my friend Adele from this institute, a real person, um, <laughs> she called me and she was like, no, 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 Kirsten, this is like an artist book. You have to create your own cover. I'm like, oh my God, no Make way. sure it will not sell. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, and then she sent me um, like this photo of this little figure from a Halloween bag from her daughter. Um, and she was like, why don't you make letters out of this figure? I'm like, oh no, I'm the worst in Photoshop. So I had to ask my assistant <laughs> to help me out. And we created then like this, you know, these kind of like glyph like rune figures, which I now like a lot because it looks like Qigong or yoga, but then also could just be street signs or 
Yeah, yeah like glyphs. So it basically all came together, even with like this final comment of a friend who's like, mm -mm, you're not done yet. <laughs> yeah. So any question? Hello. Um, I wanted to ask if, and this is, I guess, directed to everybody, if you think that in this mystical lineage, if contemporary art is is the space where these mystical ideas can be found, um, and relating to that, this idea of this 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 fear or reluctance to talk about the divine or spirits or sort of even mentioned the word God, you, know, you can't, can't, can't say it, um, you know, that, that, that these mystical things are happening, whether people want them, whether people want to acknowledge them or not. Um, and so, yeah, and so, 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 so is contemporary art the place where, the place where this is happening right now? I guess that, that's my question. Thank you. Well, I think contemporary art is, has always been so porous, and this is why it became the dominant art form, that it can hold anything that's in the air, anything that's traveling through our time, the container of contemporary art can invite it in and hold it somehow. Um, I think it's in many places. Um, but this is maybe the, the cultural container for it. Also, I mean, both scenically and Comically, I would say it's probably the only field where those positions can be taken seriously. And I say that with, you know, <laughs> irony and great respect that, um, you know, in the world of contemporary art, we accept everything. And that's, uh, that's great. You know, I also think it leaves plenty of room for terrible beliefs and behaviors, but it's, uh, you know, art has open arms. Uh, and so, you know, any freak is welcome. <laughs> I have maybe two questions, but the first is anytime um, a book is produced, it by definition takes the sequencing of a series of images um, and makes them permanent. Whereas the inspiration of the drawings perhaps from the tarot is the opposite of that, right? The free floating, um, ability of the cards to appear and disappear in random orders foretelling the future, or so it might be suggested. In your exhibitions, and we only got to see the one at Badstone, um, was the sequencing of the drawings set as the same in each location? It didn't seem as though the way you structured the environment, that would even have been possible. So you must have thought about how the difference between the series of the drawings and the series of the drawings in the book would be, by definition, radically different. Yeah, I mean, actually, in the show at Gladstone, as well as at Jumakunis, the display changed. So that's why I included these shelves where you could literally just pick them up and like, do like a little a different reading every day. You could just, because they are actually just with C cleats on the wall, these, um, the frames. So um, there was this idea of like this transitioning, also going, extending into the exhibition space. Um, and it also happened. I think we changed the um, display several times. And um, what was the question in the book? Yeah. Well, it took a long time to find... Um, because I didn't want it to be chronological and I had to, I don't know, I had to like make intuitive decisions where actually not just the motifs um, made certain sense, so to say, um, in the order, but also the titles. Because the minute I changed um, the drawings in the book, the order of them, also the titles changed. So I had to like make this split between like, how does the title work as the poem? So works in a way that I'm happy with it. And it actually starts with um, 
in German, but in English would say the question how it actually has been. And the last um, image is uh, Rand der Welt, um, the corner of the world. So I thought, oh, that's actually nice that it starts with a question and it ends with a corner of the world. And so it's basically open up again. Um, yeah. Yeah, there was also this moment, it was kind of like a productive crisis moment. We were still trying to save money and save pages and also maybe interrupt a certain rhythm of the book where we originally had always just one drawing on the left, the title on the, on the right and the title on the left. And then we suddenly said, what if we do a few spreads with two images? What happens? And suddenly it's like a dramatic difference. And first, Kerstin, I think you were kind of uncomfortable and then you got interested in how it feels different as a flow and as a mm -hmm. as a spread um, but just to kind of confirm those are like big moments like almost like crisis moments um, and, and you've worked previously with books the MFA exhibition was a series of zines right produced in a plexiglass case in endless editions so the history of your work with books is extensive, career career long, right? And I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how that um, relationship really works for you as an artist whose practice is so varied, right? So varied in its content, so varied in its materiality, so varied as Moss suggested and who's doing it. Um, so what, what's the role of books um, in that practice that's either been important or episodically important and uh, at times unimportant? Hmm. Good question. I mean, uh, I mentioned before I studied with Lothar Baumgarten, who is like <laughs> the bookmaker. And um, so I had a lot of respect in making books because of this like history with Lothar. Um, so I guess the first books I made were, were Xerox copies. So I thought, well, that's, you know, can handle that. I don't need to think about typography of Walter Nichols or something in that moment. But um, I guess it was almost like training, a training of the eye, right? How does an image stand in relation to a certain space on the page? How does it relate to the materiality, the paper? And how does it... Um, also create a relationship with typography. And I mean, in this case, this book is really interesting because the designer we worked with, Petra Hollenbach, who did an incredible job because the typography she, she suggested and also how she set um, each uh, text reference in a different, um, how to say, uh, a block, or how, how would you say this in English? Yeah, in a different column. Um, I thought was that was really um, incredible. And I think in general, with all the graphic designers I um, have worked with so far, I mean, obviously, everyone's different. And it was, in each case, like a great, somewhat challenging collaboration. Um, but um, yeah, I like a lot that you have to however complex the practice can be or the body of work can be that you have to then find this other like medium for it which is like everlasting um and uh and find a way to translate then that practice in this like somewhat fixed um medium of bookmaking and then also i mean actually hmm, i don't know but uh, i was uh, trained as a um not trained, but I studied uh, children's book illustration in Germany before I studied art. And they actually still had like this letter set um, workshop. And so it was really physical. So everything at that moment in time was, I mean, of course, people already worked on computer programs, but um, I remember also working literally with like letter set. And um, so it has like, has like both aspects, right? The, somewhat like digital and like very physical um, approach. Hi, thank you so much for this talk. Uh, my question is for Kirsten. Could you talk about color 
and your experience of, of making these drawings. Uh, does color have like a representation for you uh, as far as like frequencies go, energetic feelings? I mean, anything you want to say, I'd love to hear your thoughts on color. I mean, it, w with this body of work, it's literally like what kind of color pencils I had at hand. <laughs> You know, it was almost the opposite of like what I was describing with the block radiance where I like used color like as this ray of light already. Um, it was a very different approach and also really frustrating because I couldn't do what I was used to do with oil on whatever medium I worked with, paper, mylar, canvas, um, because it... Um, yeah, it's so immediate and also so um, it's kind of restricted, you know. Um, so I try to like do all these like shadings with through erasing and um, like really erasing again and going over it and erasing. So like all these like various spaces were created. But I mean, it's yeah, it's very specific. What can you do with? And actually, I then discovered different companies like Faber Castell has a different uh, much sharper um, and also different color range than uh, polychromos I assume more soft so then I got obsessed with that like the different materialities of the actual colored pencil and the shades the tra trademarks would um, offer there was a question in the back Um, yeah, hi. I was just wondering, um, because you mentioned uh, that you put in um, some anthropologists um, writing in the book and you were talking about your process and like the sort of um, like shaman, um, sh showman kind of uh, qualities that you, you have. And I was wondering if you guys um, like interrogated at all the idea that um, you're kind of embodying this... Um, Persona that in a lot of cultures is a hugely important um, aspect of their spirituality and their religion and um, what it means for you um, to be making that art um, in New York as a German painter and um, kind of uh, whether or not you kind of explored that at all and your role in um, the commercialization of those practices. That was a question for me. So, I mean, I'm not at all, would, I would never claim like that I'm a shaman because that's very specific. And um, But what I tried to say before is that I actually use my body um, in a way that, I mean, through COVID and through being stuck in this like small space, my rental apartment, it, it felt like... Um, I'm using the body as, or I experienced it as this like elusive center of gravity. And um, maybe, yeah, maybe that, that was more like what I was trying to discover. And, and also many of my works and specifically this body of work is really intuitive. So it's not, and even if there's like many references from like my surroundings where I've been, whether it's like literally na nature or like what I've been working on um, before or what I've re been reading or researching, yes, that all has an influence, but um, the actual making of the works was, um, it was really like a hovering between like seeing, being, seeing, being, um, opening up, closing, opening up. Closing, like it was very um, transitory, or how would you say? Yeah, I think the term shaman only appeared because of Boetti's work, Shaman Showman, which many people know, and it's so playful and is the embodiment of this constant movement and, and no arrival inside. So, um, last question or? Hi, um, thank you for your lecture, everyone. Um, 
Hi, my question is more about the construction of the drawings. I noticed that some of them have pieces that extend past the borders. Um, and I also noticed, well, I'm, I'm curious and maybe assuming that there's some drawings that got thrown out or that didn't make the cut, or I'm curious how you approach that. Um, and if those little pieces are fragments from those drawings. And I glued them back into the new drawings. So, I mean, actually at the time I, when I arrived in Berlin, what happened is then I almost introduced like the series of women, which you see, um, not right now, <laughs> but, um, um, and yeah, like collage technique. So I was cutting up all the paintings and drawings and then gluing them from behind and from the front to create again, like a different type of um, space. And then sometimes they went over the border, which I liked that they were like reaching out like antennas. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank everyone, you so much. For coming.